Yeah, Professor Kaya, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I don't need to introduce my, I mean, let me introduce myself for those who were not here or who came late. My name is Hassan Kaya. I'm from South Africa. I'm the director of the National Center in Indigenous Knowledge Systems at the University of KwaZulu Natal, based in Durban. And we're here to share with you an African philosophy known as Ubuntu and how it goes in public health care. Because one of the mandates we have at the center <coughs> is to preserve, promote, protect indigenous knowledge systems. And I start also by explaining to those who are not aware or who don't know what indigenous knowledge systems are about, I start with that one. <coughs> Yesterday, when we started, Derek tried to explain to us, both theoretically and operationally, what bioethics is all about, the love of life, and how the concept was liberated from medical dominance to biology and from our international perspective we want to liberate it further from biology to a small holistic approach that health as the World Health Organization says it's not just a biological aspect there's psychological emotional and spiritual aspects and from the knowledge perspective, we are looking at the fuse of love, of life, from that holistic perspective. And from this perspective of indigenous knowledge systems, we start with the premise that as human beings, we live in different ecosystems, different environments. Even yesterday, they really tried to mention that when it was dealing with the different dimensions of bioethics, one of the issues was the issue of environment and also even beyond. Because as we live in different ecosystems, we try to develop useful information systems on how we adapt to that particular environment. We develop different belief systems, value systems, principles which guide how we live with one another in that particular ecosystem. In other ways, we evolve different cultural relationships, interdependencies, connectedness as we live together. And that interdependence, that connectedness as we live together in that particular ecosystem is not between just us as human beings, but also with the other forms of creation, in other words, environment. There is a kind of symbiotic relationship. In other words, from an indigenous perspective, health is not just a biological aspect. It's between us as human beings and other forms of creation. And that interconnectedness, as we live together in this symbiotic relationship, we evolve particular values on how to deal with one another issues of compassion, issues of love, issues of caring, because all those aspects, reciprocity, issues of duty, all those interconnectedness are part and parcel of what makes us health. Because if one aspect misses, we're not healthy. It might be biologically not sick, but if you stole someone's money, you're not happy. If your child is not healed, well, you are also affected if a member of your family. In other words, we live in a kind of situation whereby you are connected with others, including the environment in which you live in. So those knowledge systems, those belief systems, those value systems which we develop in our particular environment, in our particular cultural setting, is what we call indigenous knowledge systems. They are authentic to that particular way of life. They are an expression of your identity 
the expression of what you are and how you relate to one another as a system. So in indigenous knowledge, especially from an Af African perspective, Africans like any other people, they live in these diversities of ecosystems, diversities of culture, and as they live in these diversities of culture and ecosystem, they develop particular principles, particular guiding principles of life on how to deal with one another, which we call in Southern Africa, in Central Africa, we call it Ubuntu. And so <coughs> the concept of Ubuntu, it comes from the common word Ntu means human. And that is not difficult to explain to other people who are not African because the values I'm going to explain or I'm going to share with you and as she will go further when he comes, she comes to talk about the universality of these value systems that they also reflect themselves in other philosophies all over the world. So Ubuntu is, means humanness, humanity. And the concept of humanity, as I said, it reflects itself in different uh, cultural systems. But the most important thing is the fact that it expresses that the interconnectedness of human beings. It connects that interdependence of human beings, not among themselves, but with other forms of creation. When we were in Kumamoto last year, there was a guy from Southern, a professor from Southern India, he also called it eco-consciousness. But the principles he was sharing with us, they're not different from the principles of Ubuntu. That humanness, using the concept humanness because it is also reflecting other <coughs> cultures. But another important dimension besides this question of interconnectedness, interdependence of humans, among themselves and the other forms of creation is the question of spirituality. What makes indigenous knowledge as a system of knowledge different from Western knowledge systems is the spirituality. Because those who are doing sociology, and sociologists, if you look at people like Abus Conte, Emily Dakhan, Herbert Spencer, they looked at knowledge influenced by natural sciences, that knowledge is only what you can see, what you can measure. Right? Anything beyond observation, anything above positivism is not knowledge. But from an indigenous perspective, knowledge is not only what you can see. Right? There are other forms of knowledge. That's why also I said, from a world health perspective, health is not only a biological thing. Right? Your psychological, your emotional, your spiritual well-being is part and parcel of your, your well-being. So knowledge also, from an indigenous knowledge perspective, involves also the issues of spirituality. And that's why even our traditional health practitioners, we are now in a project of trying to interface traditional medicine and the pharmaceutical sciences. But our healers are saying, if you want to work with us, you must accept the spiritual aspect of knowledge. Yeah. And when you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, and all other for Islam, the spiritual aspect comes also in the issue of uh, public health care. So that is also an important aspect. And that's why from an African indigenous perspective, I think, and I should going to discuss later, when she comes to present, the issue of spirituality also reflects in other philosophies of the world, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever they are. And that one distinguishes indigenous knowledge and the concept of public health care from other Western or biological sciences. So the interconnected, as I said, it is reflected in the question of compassion, the process, the dignity, and humanity, and that question of relationship. But there are certain basic principles in which, as I said, Africa, most of the people when they talk of Africa, the thing is the village. Africa is the second largest continent in the world. But most people outside Africa I think Africa is a village. Can I ask you, oh, I have a friend of mine in Ghana. Do you know him? Yes, he's where to come from India. I ask you, do you have a friend of mine in Nepal? Do you know him? Yeah. See what? Africa is a big continent. 
But in spite of his big size, diversity, whatever they are, Cultural, but there are certain common principles in which we share and which are reflected in this philosophy of Ubuntu. One important aspect which you also see in other philosophies of the world, which is central to African philosophy of Ubuntu, is humanness, this interconnected, this interdependence between humans and other forms of creation is a question of character. In most African languages, you don't have a concept called morality as we have perhaps in other languages of society. For us, the most important aspect in morality, in African moral thought, is the question of character. In other words, we differentiate, you can become a human, but you're not a person philosophically and in the moral terms. Because the personality, the personhood of a person is your character. And that's what distinguishes African social thought in terms of African moral thought from other moral thought in the sense that with this you can become a person or you can become a human being physically or whatever, but your character, your behavior is not human. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain expectations you are expected as a human to behave, to become a person. And that's why, and there are different expressions in terms of language used in different African cultures to explain that aspect of your character as a human being. So that is, in the concept of Ubuntu, character becomes very central. And is expressed in different languages to express what is good, what is wrong, what you do, something good among other people, with other people, brings people together. And if you do something wrong, if you exploit others, if you are rude to others, if you don't relate nicely to other forms of creation, you are cruel to animals, you are cruel to your family, whatever, you are not a person. That is very central in African moral thought. And it is said, the issue of language is expressed differently. And also, if you look at the other philosophies of life, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, they have also different technologies to express that personhood, that concept of character as a moral fiber of a, of a human being. Another important aspect, I'm trying to give you all these principles of Ubuntu, later on I connect them to public health care so that you understand what Ubuntu is all about and how it relates to issues of public health care. The concept of humanity, brotherhood and sisterhood. Most people don't understand if you go to the United States, if you come to Africa, you find black people calling one another brother, sister, things like that. But you are not related by blood or whatever. But it is a moral aspect Brotherhood, sisterhood expresses this association of humanity. If we share the same humanity, if I consider you as a human being, if we live together, you share our rooms, we have people who share our rooms, roommates. You can live together there, you can develop a relationship without being blood related. But the fact that you share common interests, you share your as a human being, you are my brother. You are my sister. And that is a concept which most Western people don't understand. But it's part and parcel of the Ubuntu philosophy. <coughs> Another important aspect in the Ubuntu philosophy is an African philosophy expressed diversely in different cultures is the concept of common good. And when the concept common good does not mean that it's an aggregate of individual interests, but there are certain things we as human beings, we share dignity. Every human being would like to be dignified, would like to be respected. Mm? So that is a common good. It's something which is an association of human beings living in the interdependence. Right? share and that is a common good which every whether you are Hindu, you are a Muslim, you are anti, there are certain things which you as a human being 
you like to be treated with. The same thing applies to other forms of creation. And Larry was telling us yesterday about how dogs and part and part of human creation or God's creation, they have particular senses, they also be tried to be treated. They can't express that in a particular language, but they have ways in which they show you can show you that they also want to be respected. They also want to be treated like you want to treat another human being or you want to be treated. So that is a notion of common good. There are certain aspects, freedom, happiness, justice, dignity, respect, are a common good for any form of human being or any form of creation. And that is part and parcel of the Ubuntu philosophy, reflected in different languages and different articulations. Another aspect which is distinguishing Western philosophy from African indigenous Ubuntu philosophy is the issue of the community. Those who are doing sociology, one of the aspects we do in sociology is the chapter on the individual and the society. What comes first? The individual or the community or society. In African philosophy, you realize your individualism because you are a member of society. And nobody in African philosophy will protect you against your family or against the community. The community comes first because we have one of the articulations of Ubuntu as a philosophy of life. I am because we are. You can realize your humanity only through others. And in other different African philosophies, there are people who believe they are kind of Ghana for example, they believe that when the human being came, he came into a village. It is an expression of symbolism that we are social. If you look at also in Aristotle, in the Greek philosophy, Aristotle says, man is a human what? Animal what? Social. Social. social animal. In other words, you can't live out of society. Otherwise, you're not a human being. And you know yourself, those who live who lived in Europe or in America, the biggest problem that Americans and Europeans face is the question of isolation. A lot of old, a lot of old people, they are lonely. And if you want to feel loneliness, if you want to see that material aspects are not important, you go to Europe when you are all alone. And Nobody, you're only maybe by there, but it's not to do with you. The most important thing I'm emphasizing here is that we are social beings. Yeah? We are social animals. You can't live outside society, otherwise you're not human. So the question also another important aspect. This the, the question of the question of interdependence, the question of connectedness. It comes also, as I'm going to show you later in public health here, is central to the philosophy of Ubuntu articulated also in different philosophies. Another important aspect, if we are interconnected, if we are interdependent, there is a kind of reciprocal care. There is a question of duty. There are people, South African constitution is being held as the most important or whatever. But the biggest problem with the South African constitution, it puts more emphasis on the freedom of the individual. There are no rights. Whereas African philosophy, traditional African philosophy, rights come with duty. You can realize your rights because you have also duty to other people. The question of reciprocal care is very important. Where the neoliberalism, the liberal philosophy, the freedom of the individual is a Western capitalist way of looking at society. But in African philosophy and also realized in Hinduism, Buddhism, duty. If you live together as an entity, if you live in a particular environment, rights go together with responsibilities. So the same thing in public health care, those things go together. Reciprocity is a second duty in African philosophy. Yeah? Duty to others, 
if you want them to care for you, you must also care for them. It's a kind of symbiotic work, relationship, which is very important. So how does all these aspects of connectedness, interdependence, compassion go into public health care? They come back to what I said before. In African traditional knowledge, African indigenous knowledge system about care, about reciprocity, is the belief that there is a symbiotic relationship between the physical, the social, and spiritual dimensions of health. Especially is not only between us human beings, but with the other forms of creation. If the environment is dirty, you are also not healthy. You know something? If you don't care about the environment, your life also won't be the same. You know something? So it's not only healthy about yourself, but in the health also what? Environmental care is very important. If you jump on dirty water, you won't be happy because you might end up at home getting diarrhea, cholera, or something like that. So another important aspect is the fact that the question of the family. Yeah? Why do we, the family become important? Why is the community important in public health care? Because if you look at that symbiotic relation between the physical, the mental, the psychological, yeah? you can't be alone. That's why also in the provisional health care, we ensure that the family, the community, the health care provider, but they make sure that the person, regardless of whatever illness she or he has, is not left alone. Because that care alone, among other people, can also help you psychologically, emotionally, to see that you are not alone. And that is part and parcel of what we want to comes into public. In other words, whatever affects into the individual affects the whole family, community, and also your ancestors. That's why I said spirituality is central to African Ubuntu. And that's why Africans, including other people who subscribe to indigenous knowledge systems, put male emphasis on making the ancestors happy. And yesterday we saw here people were happy or sad. Erico, the president, used the festivities outside. Young people have a starting parcel of the Ubuntu philosophy of the fact that the spiritual world is part and parcel of our happiness, what he called the love of life. So the healing process in also in African traditional medicine involves a dialogue because our spiritual healers, our African traditional health practitioners, they believe that when you go, when the patient goes to the healer, it is the ancestors of the healer and your ancestors who are in what? In dialogue. It's a belief. You might also have the same reciprocity in your religion. So the ancestors of the patient and the healers are in dialogue on how they're going to make you what? feel better. So according to Ubuntu philosophy, the ethical duty of the health practitioners is to restore that sense of value and worth to, to alleviate feeling of isolation from despair. That's why you find that health care providers, yeah, they want to bring that family atmosphere so that you don't feel alone. That's why also we emphasize that in mental health care, most of health, I mean, I was doing a kind of research, different uh, Asian communities. Most of the people respond that they would like to be treated at home, in a community rather than in an isolation somewhere, in a isolated place. Because that care from the family, that care from the community also helps the mental health patient to also to feel better. So <clears throat> the question of compassion and care of persons with the illness that we the health practitioners are urged to encourage and assist. So these are also that care, I mean, the only the patient himself must also be given the opportunity to express her situation. And in the African traditional societies, we use different media in terms of songs, in terms of dances, and all folks' kinds of media so that the patient 
is not just fees and an object becomes part and parcel of the healing one process. That is the philosophy of Mukunda. Yeah? In other words, you don't make him isolated. You don't make the patient feel that he or she is just an object of the treatment, but he must or she must be part and parcel of the whole healing process in the case of storytelling, in the case of celebration, performing rituals, community living. So you find that through drumming, through singing, whatever, he or she feels that she's part and parcel of the caring process or, or the healing process. So in <coughs> African tradition of medicine, healing methods consider passion, caring, respect, dignity, love central to restoring the sense of well-being in those who are ill. Yeah. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say here is the same thing I talked before, the holistic aspect of public health care from the Ubuntu philosophy. And I'm trying to give a number of examples in which the philosophy of Ubuntu of caring, compassion, family, removing the sense of isolation is being used in particular aspects. If you come to South Africa and the other African countries, for instance, they use the philosophy of Ubuntu for HIV AIDS project children. There's so many children. Africa is one of the continents where HIV AIDS has a high impact. And you find a lot of children who are left alone, the parents are dead. You find children at the age of 10, 15 caring for their own siblings because the parents are not there. So as part and parcel of caring, this Ubuntu philosophy of interdependence, connectedness, compassion, different initiatives are being instituted to ensure that these orphan children affected by HIV AIDS are not left alone. They don't feel isolated. So there are a number of projects which are done for HIV AIDS children, and it's not only for the children, also for other members of society and social groups which are being affected by HIV AIDS. For instance, if you come to Jobek, there is the Ubuntu Institute of HIV AIDS Program in South Africa. One thing which is very unique, it is also based in Pretoria, Johannesburg, and also the head one in Cape Town, and also in the Northwest province of Africa, whereby, because the biggest problem in HIV AIDS is change your behavior. You see that people, you can talk all sorts of things here about HIV AIDS, but the same people who talk behind the scenes, they do other things. You know something? Yes. Change your behavior is the biggest challenge in the question of mitigation against HIV AIDS. And what the Institute is trying to do is to involve traditional healers, to involve traditional leadership, and the religious leaders, because they believe that these people because they are connected with cultural issues. That's why yesterday when uh, Rajiv was presenting about the issue of sexual education, it's a very complex topic. Because you are in a situation whereby Hindus, Muslims, uh, was also African traditional religion, whatever, in a classroom, what sort of sex education are you bringing there? It becomes very complicated. And sometimes we take Western definitions, bring them in an environment which doesn't match. Yeah? That's why the discussions and then we just get quiet. Because it's a very complicated aspect. We bring, take the things in a homogeneous society in Western countries and we bring it in a society where there were so many people from different cultural backgrounds and you say we're teaching them sexual what? Education. Because people understand those things different. Something. And I don't would want to go on that one. <coughs> but the most important thing in this institute is the fact that they realize that the moral authority traditional leaders have, religious leaders have, traditional healers have in changing the social behavior of people. For instance, addressing the vulnerability of young women and girls in HIV AIDS. Because those are question of change of behavior. Because if you look at sex, what you call sex education, in sociology, those who are in sociology, we don't have a topic in sociology called sex education. We have a topic called sexuality. 
because the concept of sexual is very complicated. Because in traditional societies, we have what we call the right of passage. Okay? Certain things, educational systems, are done at a particular time okay? in your right of passage. This yes, will go to initiation, schools, where you go there and as girls, when you reach a particular age, you are prepared to be a good wife, good husband, whatever. So this question of sex education, whatever you call it, you see, they've got different ways of articulating it. Right? That's why when you bring in an environment where the concept is different, people are just listening to you because the mother at home says something different. And it, even at home there, it happens because indigenous knowledge also is being managed in a different way from Western knowledge. We do it in the edgy groups, we do it in according to social status, you do it according to, there are certain things you can't teach people who are not married. There are certain things you can't say to people who are not married. There are certain things you can only say to people who are social study. So all these things are, are part and parcel of education that take into consideration. So in a classroom of, of go from more, you see what I mean, what I'm trying to say here is these things are done in particular cultural context, they look at particular cultural meanings. So if you come from a cultural society, try to ensure that what you are teaching matches with what the child is experiencing. So they also deal with the question of promoting the role of men in HIV AIDS prevention because the thing is only particular, like when you, uh, Rajiv was also showing pictures yesterday, I don't know, it's Rajiv or whatever, they, most of them were only what? Women. HIV not just a women problem, it's, it's the woman that not infect herself, most of the yeah. So it involves both the gender sections. So the question here is, they also look at those. That's why in initiation schools, you put initiation schools for boys, initiation school for girls, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife. There are certain responsibilities, rights and responsibilities. Yeah, so in sex education, don't just emphasize rights, you must also emphasize issues of duty. Those things go together. So there are also a question of productive sexual, productive education, yeah? as a mother, as a father, discouraging multiple current partnerships that is done in a particular context. You see what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to say is they are going through all those aspects, but in that context, traditional healers are involved, traditional leaders are involved, parents are involved. Siblings and what is a kind of holistic. You bring people who have experience on those aspects, they talk to young people on those issues. That's why I'm actually talking yesterday that you can also we also try as much as possible when we are promoting indigenous knowledge programs, education programs, and make sure that the knowledge holders they are involved in the process. But somewhere just because she, she has a degree in uh, sociology or in public health, they go and teach Hindu children about sexuality, while the priest or the whatever they are, say something different. So by bringing these moral, cultural leaders who in the education system, in the change of behavior system, becomes part and parcel of public health care. Another as aspect <coughs> of the, those are some of the programs there in which you also do research on the capacity building, issues of educational awareness, research on ongoing uh, risk measures, evaluation programs conducted periodically. The question is to ensure that research fits in the awareness programs and those things grow together. The last aspect is the fact that there are also programs in Africa, especially in Zambia there, where they use sports. Eh? The culture to Ubuntu philosophy, all these caring, compassion issues to bring using sports to ensure that they become part and parcel. Because sports bring people together. Mm? It's one aspect which tends to be neglected in bringing a community of common goods, a community of sisterhood and brotherhood. So the same thing is the question of the holistic approach to healthy care. We ensure that issues of sports for children for different social groups 
I use to make people feel more human, more cared, people are not isolated. I think I should stop there. Thank you. I don't know why you stopped there, but it seems like a lot more to talk about. <laughs> um, thank you, it's very interesting. We can have a first round of questions now. <coughs> Kako, please. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was <coughs> listening with a great interest. Pass the mic, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a very basic question about <coughs> definition of indigenous. Because um, when you say indigenous, uh, what comes to my mind first is the uh, group of people who um, originally inhibited in a certain community, whether it's village or town or a certain region. Uh, so when I think of indigenous group of people in Japan, I think of uh, Ainu people because that's where they originally inhibited, inhabited. Uh, but I imagine in the region or a country like uh, South Africa, because a great mix of people, uh, diversity in ethnic groups, racial groups, uh, when you say indigenous people in South Africa, are you specifically identifying certain group of people? Uh, and even if you do so, are there competing ideas or uh, <coughs> uh, um, ideas about who are most authentic indigenous people? Yeah, that is a very common question which is being asked in societies which have diverse cultural groups. The question of, it's not only South Africa, I mean the rest of the continent, you find that we have, just as someone was saying, yesterday India has over 300 ethnic groups, Nigeria has 400 ethnic groups, one of the largest countries. But you find the diversity. The issue of South Africa is a bit complicated in the sense that if you look at the Africana there, the whites came from Cap. It's a mixture of Dutch, French, Germany, whatever. They even developed over time their own language, which we call Africans. They even use it in universities. The universities which are only Africans, purchased from Stellenbosch and other institutions, the University of Pretoria. These people also, they also claim that they also what? Indigenous. <laughs> The concept of indigenous, in the sense that when we define the characteristics of indigenous, you know something static. Originally, when this why the common definition used is the one used by the United Nations, and they only define it to those communities in North America or in Australia, the Aborigines, whatever, which Europeans met there. The same thing in South Africa, you find that the Sun people claim that they're only the ones indigenous in, came in South Africa because when Europeans came, they were there, other people came from somewhere. But the, the indigenous, the concept indigenous is something that expresses the concept of authentic expression, especially in terms of knowledge, that when people live in a particular community, over time, as I said, they evolve particular knowledge systems particular belief systems in that particular environment. If you, for instance, you go among the Swanas in Northwest province, you go among the vendors, they occupy that over time. And when you go there, they are different from the parents or they live in the same province. So it's something which is dynamic. That's why it's this source, I mean, the concept of indigenous is still debatable. But the most important thing in the fact that is community-based knowledge systems. That is, people live in a particular environment. They devolve a particular knowledge system, you know, to adapt to that environment. And it's changing. And when you talk of indigenous knowledge, it's not necessarily knowledge which has been used 
thousands or hundreds of years ago. It is changing because as you interact with other people, eh, you also incorporate new knowledge systems which are being part, become part and parcel of the world, of, of, of the community. That's why we are more interested in the community knowledge rather than debating on what is indigenous, whatever. Because we, in South Africa now, we went through those debates in the <coughs> 1990s, because that's why we started debating what is indigenous, who is indigenous. But the most important thing now, we are emphasizing now, is the fact that when you use the concept of indigenous knowledge, other people call it environmental knowledge, other people call it traditional knowledge, is the fact that it's community-based knowledge systems which people use, they're still using. Yesterday we saw that more than 80% of Africans, they still depend on traditional medicine. Mm? It's a traditional knowledge. It's knowledge which is available in the community. I think that is what we should put emphasis now, rather than go into definition. The most important thing when you talk about indigenous is the authentic knowledge, knowledge which is based in the community, which people use to sustain their life. The same thing where it was my first time when I went to last year to Japan. Mm -hmm. I always thought Japanese were just a what? Homogeneous society. But the young that guy in Tokyo mm -hmm. told us they are also indeed people who are in the one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I don't know which part of Japan, the eastern part or whatever they did. I didn't know about it. Because they claim that that's the original people there around everything. But the most important thing now, in our center, when we promote indigenous knowledge, we promote community-based knowledge systems, which people in a particular ecosystem, particular environment, use to sustain their lives. And it's not that it's not static, it's changing, dynamic, adaptive. That's why we also say it's very easy for a traditional healer to refer a patient to a modern doctor, but not the other way around. And this shows how indigenous knowledge, the way you question it, or oh, the way you put it, the community place is more dynamic or adaptable <coughs> to other systems. It's a very complicated concept, but we, that's why we simplify it as a community-based system rather than spending days debating what is indigenous, who is indigenous. Yeah. Maybe I try to help with that also. Let's take Prof says it's a community that's within a certain environment that have developed their own ways of knowing. Um, I remember once we were going to the Kila, their, 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 their school and their um, uh, nursery and their pharmacy. And on our way, we were using a taxi. Okay? A taxi was taking us to there. So we were taking visitors and we were making our way to that school. And Someone asked the same question, you know, what is indigenous knowledge, where, you know, where are we going, is it, you know, African communities that are indigenous, not Indian, and not Italian, and so on and so forth. And I said, see this taxi driver that's driving. In this community of taxi drivers, they have their own knowledge systems, their own ways of communi com communicating with each other. So I may not know, let's say if, I, if you come to South Africa, you won't know the communication systems that might be needed for you to get to central town, for you to go down the road. That knowledge system is what is sustaining their livelihood. That community, we recognize. And I, I think you were trying to ask, is it indigenous in the, in the usual or the common sense? Let's take bake, baking. I spoke about Italians. We went to a food festival once, and we had gone along the sunny pass, the, uh, the Limpopo border between South Africa, and in Popo, uh, um, Lisuchu in South Africa. And um, uh, we had the food festival. We had some um, Boer, uh, Africana people that were there. They were cooking food. And then there were some uh, young uh, black African uh, bakers that were baking in a little, and they called themselves Italian bakers. But they were African, you know. And they had modernized their baking skills, their indigenous skills of baking, but they infused some Italian, you know, flavors to it. And they were making like sort of rolls or uh, with flour on it. So we're saying that these communities have evolved over time because of the influences that they've had wherever they might have found themselves. Take our Indian medicine. When the Indians came across from India into South Africa, we found that a lot of our plant material that we may have used for our medicines were not available in South Africa. 
So we ended up um, working very closely. Our healers work very closely with the African healers. And now you find there's a lot of commonality between the type of plants that we use and um, uh, what we use them for, how we use them. Um, but sometimes the you'll find there are some alien plants in the country as well that we have brought across and that they also have made use of because they found it to be similar in, in, in use. So um, we too have become indigenous because we have depending on the same local environment that they are using. But you'll find me still relating to Indian culture as well. So if someone asks me where am I born, I mean, am I Indian? Oh, I'm South African. That is my home. So that's how I identify myself as well. So I don't know if that helps, Prof? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, the question we are trying to say here, I mean, the question, concept of indigenous has evolved. You see, you must also look at that concept and not staying somewhere. You see what I'm saying? Time goes. It's not in terms of, of, of the knowledge, also in terms of, for instance, maize. Maize is originally from Latin America. It's not authentic to Africa. But it's like the most common food eaten among most of the people in Southern and Eastern Africa. Right? It's part of the identity of the people. They've been naturalized. Right? And even the way they cook it, although it came from Latin America, and Latin America from Mexico, from Guatemala, come there. He might know that the maize came there, but the way it is being used and utilized is totally different. Eh? The same thing with rice. Rice might have come from Asia, which almost killed the indigenous uh, rice, which was being uh, now is good. But the way the Africans cook it, it's the same thing with chapati, or eh? roti. The way I come originally from East Africa, the way we make chapati or roti is totally different from the way Indians make it, although it originally came from where? From India. You see what I'm saying? So it is an authentic expression of the people there. Although they might have taken from somewhere, but they have already adapted it and it becomes part of their identity. The Africaners came, there's a mixture of Italians, Dutch, whatever, came but however, they, when they moved the four track from Cape of Good Hope up to the north where they were running away from the British, they involved different systems of survival the other way, which is totally different <coughs> from other Europeans. An authentic expression of themselves as a people. So when people talk of indigenous, they have that United Nations concept of that the original people who were there before whatever. It's a very key to that. For instance, the way I knew that with a friend of ours called Rag together. When they came with that revolutionary way of looking at ethics, environmental ethics totally different from the way of universalizing environmental ethics. We came the first conference we did in Cape in, in Durban, was part of it, trying to look at the cultural implications of environmental ethics, different from the way the United Nations looks at it. What I'm trying to say to you is, you must also look at the concept of indigenous in a dynamic, changing way within particular cultural context, not the way to be defined by somebody Somewhere. It might be difficult for you, but over time you get it. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yes, Navina, please. No, no, it's okay, then I can talk. Please. No, he likes it. <laughs> I like the, the. Well, thank you, Professor, for the wonderful presentation. But my question is you see, it talk more about indigenous system, but how they are getting adopted to this kind of uh, projects because it's a more related to cultural perspective, right? In in the place that you are into it, mm -hmm. it is very difficult to put forth something in a uh, well-educated system. Even if you wanted to add one point in a well-educated system, it is very difficult. But when we are talking about a cultural uh, perspective where they are too much involved with their own self, how we are trying to put this point and Trying to be come out with a behavior change. How are you? I hope you understood what I wanted no, I to think say. I, I understand what I was saying. I mean, the question is that's why we we encourage cultural dialogue. You see what I'm saying? Whereby different cultures come together mm -hmm. right, and try to share experiences. Okay. That is one way in which we, for instance, we had, uh, I think it was this last year or the year before. 
a mother tongue, we were trying to see the importance of mother tongue for science and technology students. We had Africana students, white students, when you talk Africana, they is not African like myself, it's Africana, they're white. They call it Africana. Most of them they live in urban environment. One student asked how does how do you promote a mother tongue in an urban environment? It's a cultural question. In the sense that well, that's why in a cultural society it is also important that people from different cultures also learn the languages of other people. I think he, she pointed to yesterday that it would be a good idea also those mentors of international students, not just emphasizing Japanese or foreign students who learn Japanese, but they must also learn, try to learn the languages of other people. So the same thing. It's the same thing when you come here. I don't know whether before I came here you know Ubuntu. Eh? It might have been conceptualized in a different way from southern India, but you come to realize, ah, the way uh, Kaya was talking is the same way we articulate uh, our uh, eco consciousness. So uh, through intercultural cross and inter what, interaction that you come to know that there are certain things which we do, other people also do the same, but in a different way, expressing different languages or different songs, things like that. So we encourage through those intercultural, especially in an urban environment, where people have an advantage of learning from other cultures, which people in the rural area don't have. This will also encourage not only between cultures in the urban environment, but cultures across ecological systems. So people know that, oh, this is how other people live. We also take children from urban areas to go and live, see people live in the rural areas. We also encourage children from rural areas to come and see life. You see what I think? There's a kind of a symbiotic relationship in terms of language, in terms of cultures. That's why we encourage other people to learn other languages, yeah, so that you understand language. People say if you speak to someone in his language, it goes deeper than you see what I'm saying. So through intercultural dialogue. Did you maybe talk about people heritage and. Yeah, we. Okay, we can talk about that. Um, what we've done is. Um, we found that we've got a concept called triple heritage, and we found that there are different cultural groups from the different regions of the world, you know, European, and Asian, African. And um, we said, let's come together on common challenges, common problems in the area. And if we have a challenge of teenage pregnancy, perhaps, or on drug abuse, or something to that effect, it affects all of us, regardless of our religious backgrounds or our cultural backgrounds. And then we say, we find that perhaps teenage pregnancy is prominent or prevalent in a certain group of people, population group. And we find that it's not so prevalent in another population group. It's there, but it's not a bad situation. What are you guys doing? How do you mitigate those type of challenges? And then we try to bridge that gap and try to learn from each other in that sense. So we take a challenge and then we find that like, proper thing. I think yeah. that is going to be the best way to yeah. interconnect and learn. Yeah, in other words, in the Triple Heritage Initiative we've started, okay. we are problem oriented. As she pointed out, they say teenage pregnant is a common problem in urban, mm -hmm. in urban or in Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. How do the Hindus look at it? Okay. How do the Muslims look at it? Yeah. How do the, the Catholics or the what? And we share those experiences. And for instance, we had, in a, what, we had a, a workshop on womanhood, yeah. mm? the concept of womanhood. How do the Christians look at it? And the Christians are not homogeneous, mm. or Catholics, or Lutherans, or whatever. Mm. How do they look at the issue of woman? What is to be a woman among the Hindus? Mm. Eh? What is to be a woman among Muslims? What is to be a woman among the Zulus? Whatever. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So you share experiences, and you come to know that it's not just a matter of con contrast, but there are also similarities. You saw me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had one uh, question. From, oh, okay. uh, one question from Canada, from Andrew. He said, uh, how often is Ubuntu verbally referenced in practice or is it ingrained and unspoken? So do you make an appeal to Ubuntu, for example? Mm. Uh, so is it verbal? No, yeah, Ubuntu is not only in terms of talking, but it's also in terms of practice. That's why I said the concept of Ubuntu is 
most African societies articulated differently. If you go to West Africa, they don't call it Ubuntu. West Africa, the Ubuntu is come from the, you know, African, but also different uh, what, kind of groupings. Just as you find in Europe, you've got the Germanic, the Dutch, the English, the Danish, whatever, they're all Germanic languages. The Russians, the Polish, the Hungarians, they're all Slavish. You see what I'm saying? So in, in Africa also, we've got a group of people, different uh, what, uh, uh, languages, we share a common word Ntu. That's why we call them the Bantu languages. So the concept of Ubuntu is articulated in Ubuntu in that way. But if you go to West Africa, the Akani, the Airways, the, the Mandinkas, whatever, they are different languages, different clusters of languages, but they have also articulation of that Ubuntu aspect. You find the, the philosophies, the value systems are similar, but articulated in different languages. So that is articulation and expressed in terms of songs, in terms of music, in terms of storytelling, whatever there. But the way people relate to one another, eh, in terms of family relationship, as I said, I gave you a practical examples where Ubuntu is being applied in public health care by taking care of orphan children, by, by taking care of disabled people, uh, taking care of people, street children on the street, try to feed what I guess is Muslim during the months of Ramadan where you're supposed to eat outside so that anybody who doesn't have the opportunity to have food can come and see it. You see what I'm saying? Eh? When I was living in Southeast Asia in Brunei, in Malaysia, there, when you go there for conferences, you're invited to everywhere. It's also an expression of what? I don't know where the answer is. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, we, we do have to stop for now and we we'll talk later this afternoon. Yeah. We'll continue on Ubuntu this afternoon as well, but we need to... Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan.